Yeah, so what a great thing to be with you, both here in the room as well as on the live stream. Thank you for participating in this important day and this important conference. And I know as our team has had the opportunity just to really even come alongside of the awesome people here at Prestonwood, your pastors, your leaders, your lay people. It's been such a privilege to, to be able to, to come together this day and, and really be able to look at what is God's call for the church? What's God's call for his people on behalf of, of foster care and adoption? And what I want to hope that we do this morning uh, is with this session is that we really unpack Biblically, what does it mean to care? Why are we called to care? Looking at the theological underpinnings of our, uh, of our call to care. You know, a lot of times in God's word, we, uh, we see a picture of, of, of commands, but sometimes we, we don't see the application. But what's really awesome about the call to care for the orphan, for the vulnerable, for the stranger, for the alien is that we actually see application of this. And so ultimately, as we walk through this, we're going to walk through the Old Testament underpinnings of this call to care, the biblical call to care. But then we're also going to look at the New Testament and where are are, are that, where's that call to care? But we're going to end, you know, I'm going to tell you the end of the story. We're going to end in the book of Ruth. And we're going to look through Ruth and how Boaz and Ruth how we see displayed the application of what God has told his people throughout time is their command to care and their command to care for the vulnerable. And so one of the things that I want to just start with is there are are close to 390,000 kids in U.S. foster care. We believe that there are about 153 million orphans and vulnerable children around the world. We know from uh, the Guttmacher Institute, which is the, the metric arm of Planned Parenthood, that they admit that there are over a million abortions that happen in our country each and every year. But what does God have to say? What does he tell his people is our response to that? And so I want to start there and take us through a tour of God's word and what he tells his people and commands his people to do on behalf of, of orphans and vulnerable children. And we're going to start uh, our tour in the book of Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy chapter 24, if you're on the live stream or here, if you have a phone or uh, an e-reader, yeah, look, you don't carry those, or a Bible, a paper copy of a Bible, uh, I do hope that you will join me as we look at these passages. But we're first going to look in Deuteronomy chapter 24. And if you're familiar with the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy was the, the, it, it was the last sermons of Moses before his time of departure. Moses wasn't going to be able to go into the promised land, but he takes all of these messages in Deuteronomy to remind God's people of God's goodness, his provision, his calling, his commands. It was his farewell addresses to the children of Israel. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 17 through 22, he reminds them of one of God's commands that is actually found in Leviticus chapter 19. And so this is a regurgitation of what has been said in Leviticus chapter 19. And this is what he says, verse 17 of Deuteronomy chapter 24. He says, you shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless or take a widow's garment and pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterwards. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. And so Moses is reminding the people, you were once enslaved. You were once vulnerable. And so when you go into this promised land that the Lord has promised you, Mostly an agrarian people again, so I'm not expecting that in a room this size and in a live stream we have got a lot of farmers or or, or agrarians, but the principle is still the same. In whatever you do, leave a piece back for the most vulnerable. Leave a little bit of yourself, a little bit of your time, 
a little bit of your talent, a little bit of your treasure. Leave a little bit for the most vulnerable. And the thing that we're introduced to here in Deuteronomy chapter 24 that's going to show itself up again in Ruth and the application we see in Ruth is we see for the first time the triad of the most vulnerable. And again, it's the, the stranger or the alien. It's the orphan and it's the widow. And these three were vulnerable because they were landless people and they were, they were people without a, a, a sense of support. And so if you think about the Old Testament, family was very important. Family is where you had your standing. Family is how you got your land. Family is how you were able to survive. For, for a woman, a husband was her spokesperson. It was the person who protected her. It was the person who fought battles for her and cared for her. And for an orphan, they had none of that. They had no family, no land, no protector. And so God is saying, remember, when you were enslaved in Egypt, when you were underneath those taskmasters, I came and I rescued you and I brought you into my fold. I brought you as my people. I established you as my people. When you go forth into the promised land, don't forget where you came from. Remember who you were and care for this triad of the vulnerable, landless, vulnerable people. No property, no land, no home. And the fatherless especially, no family, no support system, no place to call home. But then we see in Isaiah, so flipping into the, the middle of the Old Testament, that in Isaiah chapter 1, God tells the people, cease to do foolish things, wash yourselves, make yourself clean, verse 16. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil from your deeds before my eyes. Cease to do evil and learn to do good. And then he gives an illustration of what it means to learn to do good in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Don't just stop doing evil but replace evil with good. And, and here's what he says in verse 17, is the good that you should replace the evil with, right? He says, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's case. In other words, Isaiah was showing the people a way back to him. The, the, Isaiah was showing the people that they needed to turn away from their pride and their arrogance, and instead begin to care for the most vulnerable. Because why? That showed the heart of God. The heart of God in the book that the prophet Isaiah has was to turn away from evil and to do good by pleading justice, correcting oppression, and caring for the fatherless, the widow, the stranger, and the alien. And so Beloved, one of the reasons that we're called to care for the fatherless and, and the vulnerable woman and the vulnerable family is because when we do that, we're mimicking the heart and the actions of God. We are, we're mimicking, we're, 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 we're following the example of our God. You need more for that. Turn to the left in the book of Psalms, Psalm 146, and the Psalms are replicit. Over and over, it's God is called the father of the fatherless, the, the, the husband of the widow, the defender of the weak. Psalm 146, verse 5 through 9, though, says, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, Yahweh, his God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice See if you hear the same underpinnings of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Who executes justice for the oppressed. Who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourner, the stranger and the alien. He upholds the widow and he cares for the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. We see in the Old Testament that people were fatherless and the Lord makes them a family through Abraham and the promise of Abraham. When he says, if you can see the stars in the sky and count them, so shall your descendants be. He takes a fatherless people and brings them into a family. They were strangers and aliens and he gives them the promised land. He gives them a land and they were orphans. And he brings them into the family of God by which they can call God their father. And beloved, as his church, 
What are we called? The bride of Christ. He gives us himself as our husband. He gives us himself as our father. And he gives us himself as our inheritance. We're no longer strangers and aliens. We're no longer widows. We're no longer fatherless. But through the gospel of Christ Jesus, which is set up by the Old Testament, we now have a husband, God, the great groom. We now have a father, Abba, our daddy. And we now have an inheritance that cannot be taken away. It is imperishable. And so we enter into the New Testament and Paul brings this two, two together full circle for us in Romans chapter 8 and in Ephesians chapter 1. And then here, if you have a Bible, in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. All of the, the stranger and the alien and the fatherless is brought together when Paul tells the church of Galatia in chapter 4, verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We have the presence of God with us. We have access to God the Father, and we have intimacy of adoption into the family of God. And because of this, it, it creates a, a response. I remember one time I was in the country of India, and the, the folks that we were with asked me if I wanted to get a handmade altered jacket. And I, I thought this was, was awesome. They said, you know, you pick whatever you want. They'll make it for you. And again, this was several years ago, but it, the total price would have been $10 to have an altered personal jacket. I got one. I was really excited. I showed the, the picture to my family back home. I sent it over email. Those were in the email days, not the FaceTime days. And I got an email back, and it was from my wife. And she said, Caleb, who's my oldest, my son, Caleb saw that you're making a jacket, and he asked if it wouldn't be too much trouble if you could make him a matching one as well. And so for $20, I, I came back home with a khaki jacket, khaki blazer for me and my son. And for years, whenever I'd wear my khaki blazer, Caleb would go to his closet and get the khaki blazer. And when I'd ask him, he said, I want to look like my dad. In the same way that children mimic their parents, we begin to mimic our father. When our adoption papers are sealed by God, our response is, we want to look more like Christ. We want to look more like our Father and less like the world. And so because of our adoption, we begin to mimic the love of God. And that's why it's so important. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, when Paul again talks about our spiritual adoption, he says this, for who all, all who are being led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you do not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you receive the spirit of adoptions as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How does that feel to know that the author, creator, and the sustainer of the universe looks down upon you and says, that's my child. That's my child. I defend him, I defend her, because that's my child. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. In the same way that my son wanted to look like his father and mimic his father, we begin to mimic our father. We begin to suffer with him. We begin to sacrifice like him. We follow in his footsteps. We were widows. We were aliens. We were strangers. We were fatherless. And through God's adoption, through spiritual adoption, he brought us in. And that's why it all culminates in the, the New Testament with the command in James 1.27. When James says religion that is pure and undefiled before God our Father is this pure and undefiled religion, to look after or to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And so we're called. We're called to care. We're called to personal holiness. 
We can't relegate this ministry to others. This is not a checkbox ministry. This is, a, this is our marching orders. This is who we are. This is our life. And this word on this part is, is to visit or to look after or to shepherd. It's very close to the word that we see of, of discipleship. It, it also means to take responsibility for their needs, to go to them and to take responsibility for them. We see the same word in James 1.27 throughout the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 50, 24 through 25, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will, same word, visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely, again, same word, visit you, and you shall carry up my bones. Brothers and sisters, what are we called to do when we're called to care for orphans and vulnerable children? We're called to care for them, to come and, 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 and protect them, to wrap our lives around them, and to shepherd them. In Psalm chapter 8, Oh, I love Psalm chapter 8. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Who is the son of man? And here it is, the same word, that you should care for him. The author, the creator, the stainer of the universe cares for us. And James 1.27 says that if you want to have pure and undefiled religion... You will care for the vulnerable in the same way that the Lord God cares for you. And think about how many children that are orphaned and vulnerable, when they think about it, who am I in a sea of 153 million orphans that you would care for me? Who, who am I that you would be mindful of me? But when we care for them in that way, we're mimicking our Father's care for us. And when I look at the stars and, and the manifold presence, when, when I look at your handiwork, who am I that you should care for me? We are mimicking God's love and God's care when we go and we care for and we visit. But then Luke chapter 1, verse 68, we see this word again. It says, blessed be the, the God of Israel. This is Zechariah when he is, he, is, he is giving praise to God for the for the the prophecy that John the Baptist would come, for he has visited and redeemed his people. God has visited. Visiting is an act of redemption, a reconciliation. We go, and what pure and undefiled religion means that we're going to orphans and the vulnerable in order to see them reconciled and redeemed by a heavenly father. And then we also see it in Matthew chapter 25 in the parable of the, the goats and the sheep. Matthew chapter 25 Verse 26, Jesus says, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me or came to me. I was in prison and you visited or came to me. Then Matthew 25, 43, he looks at the goats and he says, I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you opposite of the word in James 1.27, you did not visit me. And so the one word from the Old Testament and the New Testament that's teaching us from the character of God is that he's concerned about looking after his people and coming to his people and caring for his people. And James 1.27 and, and Deuteronomy chapter 24 from the Old and New Testament explicitly tell us the biblical mandate is a call to care. It's a call to care for the triad of the vulnerable the stranger and the alien, the widow and the orphan. And so I ask us today, church, whether you're a member of this church or another church, if you're a child of God, I ask you, do we have a true religion or do we have a false religion? Because a false religion bases things on me. A true religion bases it on others. So God gives us a mandate to care, but then this is where I want us to spend the balance of our time. He gives us a beautiful application in the book of Ruth. He doesn't just give us these commands and say, go figure out what that looks like, but he shows it to us in the book of Ruth. And so I want to paraphrase chapter one of Ruth because the richness of what we're going to look at is Ruth chapter two. But if you're not familiar with the book of Ruth, 
Ruth is a narrated book, so just like if you've read a narrated thing, we know kind of what's going to happen before the characters do. So it's kind of like watching that movie where you're like, don't go into that room. We already know what the characters don't know. So we see something beautiful without the book of Ruth. But, but what happens in Ruth, to set this up, is Elimelech is a, is a Jewish man, and there's a famine in the land of Israel. And so what does Elimelech do? He does exactly what God tells us not to do. He takes matters into his own hands. And he moves into enemy territory. Now, I realize where I am. I know that Texas is a big state, but I know there's also two large universities that sometimes have a little animus against each other. One's Texas A&M, Aggies, and the other is the Texas Longhorns, right? And if you're not one of those, great. But those are the two big power brokers in the state of Texas. And of course, this next year, I'm from Alabama, home of the SEC, Now, Texas A&M, who thought, hey, we got out of the Big 12, into the SEC, away from the nemesis. Now, Big Brother, sorry for Texas A&M fans, yes, Big Brother is coming to the SEC, and all of that's right back there. Now, there's a lot of hatred between Texas A&M and Texas. Where I'm from, I would say Alabama and Auburn. There's a lot of hatred there. Maybe you're from the Northeast, think Red Sox and Yankees, okay? Except this is a whole lot worse. The Israelites and the Moabites literally couldn't stand one another. And if you go back to Judges, the Moabites were one of the people that God had said, hey, you need to go in and you need to annihilate. And guess what Israel did? They didn't do what God called them to do. And so their worst enemies, the Moabites. And yet, so think about how desperate Elimelech had to be. This is a Texas A&M grad that's going into Austin, Texas, into the University of Texas. And he's moving there to look for a better life with a diploma on his wall from the Texas A&M. Okay, you you got the picture? But something happens when they get to Moab. All the men die. Elimelech dies. His two sons who would take Moabite wives as their own. Again, think about God's way where he said, do not intermarry with pagans. They had intermarried with pagans. The sons die, and so you've got Naomi, who's left with two daughter-in-laws, And then there's this passage in Ruth, and I hope I'm not destroying people's marriages when I say this, but there's a a verse that a lot of times we use in marriage when it says, your people will be my people, your God will be my God, where you go, I will go. This was not a husband and a wife, this was a daughter-in-law to her mother-in-law. Try that at a wedding ceremony. Bride looks over at her mother-in-law, your people, my people, your God, my God, where you go, I go. Right? That's, there's usually not a lot of a love lost between a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law. But this is what happens. And Ruth says, hey, I'm not going to stay. Naomi, your God's my God. Your people, they're my people. Where you go, I go. So functionally at the end of Ruth, Ruth has lost her husband. So guess what she is? She's a widow. Ruth is going to go tell her Moabite parents, I'm going back to Israel. Guess what she would become? an orphan, and she's going into a land that's not her own. She's a stranger, and she's an alien. And so Ruth chapter 2 starts with Ruth, a stranger and an alien, a widow, and an orphan. She encompasses all of the triad of the vulnerable, and then we see Ruth chapter 2. So if you've got your Bibles, I'm a quick reader. I'm going to read through Ruth chapter 2. Think about Deuteronomy chapter 24. When you you go through your fields, you're going through your harvest, don't don't beat it down, but leave a little bit, what? For the stranger and the alien, the widow and the orphan. Boaz is a landowner, still in the story. Look at what he does for Ruth, starting in Ruth chapter one. Now, Naomi had a relative of, of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to part of the field belonging to Boaz, who huh, was of the clan of Elimelech, Ruth's father-in-law. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to his reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young men who were in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? 
And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she continued from early morning until now except for short, short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen, my daughter. Do not go to an, glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother, orphan, in your native land, stranger alien, to a people who you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servants, though I am not one of your servants." Verse 14, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed her the roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and then she had uh, some left over. This is a Jewish uh, doggy bag. And when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from your bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. And then she beat out what she gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went to the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her the food that she had left over, again, the Jewish doggy bag, after being satisfied. And her mother said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So I want us to see... Six quick things that we see from Boaz. That's the application of James chapter 1, verse 27. That's the application of Deuteronomy chapter 24 and Leviticus 19. That's the application of Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. First, we must take notice of orphans. We must take notice. Notice that, that Ruth was not a charity case to Boaz. She wasn't just the, the stranger, the alien, and the widow that happened into the field and he's like, well, there's that Jewish commandment that I can't pick everything up. I better let her pick it up. But, but when he comes back from Jerusalem, he said, whose young woman is this? Think about Boaz. He, he, was, he was a major landowner. He had many, many fields, and he notices. He takes notice of the vulnerable woman in his field. He then says in verse 8, he says, don't go to another field, but stay here. Stay close. Beloved, in the same way, we must take notice of the vulnerable. We cannot live our lives in such a way that we're blind to the vulnerable around us. We cannot live our lives in such a way that we see vulnerable children and vulnerable women and vulnerable families as someone else's problem. We have been given the responsibility to take care of the vulnerable as God's children. We must take notice. And real quick, think about that. Who are we emulating when we take notice of the vulnerable? It's not just Boaz. It's Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 5, 6 through 8. For when we were weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One will scarcely die for a righteous person, though for, for perhaps a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We are redeemed because Christ Jesus took notice of us. And the word of God is implicit. We must take notice of the vulnerable. But then second, we provide for the vulnerable. We provide for orphans. Boaz takes care of Ruth's needs, her shelter, her food, her clothing, her essentials. This was extravagant love. Boaz was going past the commandments. He wasn't just doing exactly what Deuteronomy chapter 24 said. He was truly being extravagant. He was, he was doing more than he was compelled to do. Why? Because Boaz knew who his God was. Boaz knew what he was called to do. He isn't reluctant to care for her. He tells his young men, do not rebuke her. And he even tells her, he says, I have made my field available to you. You don't need to go anywhere else. 
I'm asking you, in the same way, have we made our lives available to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow? Are we available? Are we ready to provide? I've said this already today, and it bears saying again. I think in a, in a place and a time that we live is such a time as this, where we, we have more than we need. When it comes to providing, it's probably not hard to think, hey, I could buy someone a meal. I could do a backpack for a child in foster care. I could, I could get groceries for a vulnerable family. The harder one is when we ask, but will you give of your time? Our time is precious. It doesn't matter who you are or what your bank account says. All of us only have so many days and so many minutes in every day. Only 24 hours, only 60 minutes in an hour, or only 60 seconds in a minute. Will you sacrifice that precious commodity on behalf of the vulnerable? Boaz, wealthy landowner. He comes, Ruth chapter 2, verse 8. He takes notice. He speaks to Ruth. He's tender to her. In the same way, our God provides for us. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verses 25 to 24, he says, Do not be anxious about your life, what you should eat or what you should wear. Do you not know that your Father will take care of you? If he looks at the birds and he feeds them, if he clothes the lilies of the field, will he not much more provide for you? When we provide for the vulnerable, we're just echoing what God has done for us. But then third, we affirm and we bless orphans. Children and their mothers live in a world full of rejection, pain, and the fear of further loss. But Boaz speaks affectionately to Ruth. He speaks tenderly to her. It's like pouring rain on a dry ground. Verse 12, Boaz said, The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by God, the God of Israel, under whose wing you have come to take refuge. Notice that Boaz also As he affirms and blesses Ruth, who does he point back to? You're in my field, but you're under the shadow and the wing of the Almighty. I'm just being a faithful steward of what God has given me. We affirm and we bless orphans. Lifeline, the ministry I serve, we have a a training and a ministry through local churches, and we call it Families Count. And what Families Count is, is, is made to do is to bring families in who've lost their kids to foster care. Families have been broken. Maybe they've abused or neglected their children. And yet Families Count is teaching them parenting skills and and, and infused with biblical principles in the gospel, providing mentors and training so that ultimately they can come to a place where it's a safe place for their children to come home. The very first week in Families Count is my favorite week because what the, the teachers and the mentors tell these broken women and broken men is this. They say, you're made in the image of God, you're special, and you have gifts and abilities that can be used for his kingdom. Brothers and sisters, you may be surprised, it's the most emotional week of the six weeks of training. Why? Because all these families have heard is, it's because of you, your kids are in foster care. It's because of your brokenness. It's because of your bad mistakes. It's because of your failure. It's because of your poverty. It's because of where you are. And yet, what does the gospel say? You're broken, but you have a God. And he made you, and he formed you, and he created you, and he made you special, and he gifted you, and you're made in his image. Blessing the vulnerable is a very first powerful act of redemption. To say you're made in the image of God. You're created in his image. You're special, and he loves you. And he died for you because of you, not because of what you've done, but because who you created you to be. And that's what God does for us. 1 John 3, 1 through 2, see what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we were. The world does not know him, but beloved, we are God's children now. We are God's children. See what kind of love the Father has given you that you should be called a child of God. God affirms and blesses us even when we're sinners. Even when our righteousness is but filthy rags, he loves us, he blesses us, he affirms us. But then the fourth thing we can do is protect orphans. And Boaz protects Ruth. He advocates for her safety. He made her a priority, not a burden. He, we, we, we can't be burdened by the commands of God, but we must joyfully serve the Lord as we serve vulnerable children and orphans and widows. 
Ruth chapter 2, verses 15 and 6, it says, Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. In other words, what did that mean? If, if, if Ruth isn't just picking up the leftovers, but begins to actually start to harvest, right? What does that mean? She's taking our profits away because she's harvesting the good stuff. Don't rebuke her and don't embarrass her, but let her do it. He's protecting her. He's protecting her, her safety, but he's also protecting her heart. Don't embarrass her, but let her take even the good stuff. And you know what? Jesus with joy protects us from the wrath that is deserved because of our sin. Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through four. Therefore, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 11. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author, the founder, and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself that you will not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Beloved, if we follow the commands and the biblical call to care, it means that we're called to protect the heart, the spirit, and the lives of the vulnerable. We are agents of God's protection for the most vulnerable. But then fifth... We honor orphans by bringing them in, by inviting them into our sacred places. Boaz invites the stranger, orphan, and widow to sit at his table. And again, in in, in these times, mealtimes were were very, very intimate, right? This was an intimacy, and Boaz was the landowner. And if you notice the way that this, this happens in Verse 14, Boaz goes right to Ruth. He says, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel into your wine. And it says that Boaz passed her her the grain. What does that mean? The stranger, the alien, and the widow was sitting at Boaz's table. He wasn't just feeding her. He had invited her in to the most sacred places. This was not a, a scene of charity. This was a scene of intimacy. Boaz was honoring Ruth. He wasn't just feeding her and providing for her, but he was treating her like family, like an equal. And so are we using our homes? Are we using our our safe places? Are we using those to help the vulnerable woman, the vulnerable child, the stranger, and the alien? The scene that I kind of look at is like the Mexican restaurant, right? You typically don't like to share dip the salsa with strangers, right? You share salsa with your family because you're going to always have that family member that double dips. And so, you know, you, you're just kind of special. Like if we're going to have chips and salsa and only one bowl of salsa, it's going to be kind of a family thing here. But what, is, what does this mean? It means inviting the dirty, the messy, the broken, the vulnerable and saying, hey, dip your chips in my salsa just to put it in a little, you know, Texas place. Dip your chips in my salsa. Come to my table, bringing you in. But isn't this what Christ Jesus does for us? Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 4, He brought me to his banqueting table, and his banner over me was love. Beloved, we need to use our homes, we need to use our families. We need to be able to be inconvenient in order to honor orphans and vulnerable children and bring them in. So maybe today you're called to help a a woman that's just found out she's pregnant. She already has three children as a single mom and she doesn't know what to do. And because we're pro-life, we don't want to just see her bring life to that child. We want to see her flourish. And so we bring her in. We bring her into our protection. We invite her in to our table. We let her take her chips and dip them in our salsa. But maybe it means you're being called to foster care, bringing a child for for a temporary period into your home, around your table, to love on them and honor them and care for them and bring them in. But then sixth, it's the final act of redemption. And it's actually found in Ruth chapter four, and it's beautiful, and it's gonna knock your socks off, so get ready. But first, there's Ruth chapter three. 
Because we're in a church, I can't read Ruth chapter 3. It's a little PG-13. Um, I'm going to sign homework, go read Ruth chapter 3 in the, the confines of your own home, not mixed company. I would, I would blush to read this, but there's a little something. It, it's all, it's PG-13, not R. It's all good. It's safe. Uh, I'll steal it a little bit. Boaz and Ruth, they have, they're sleeping in the same place. They're not married. They're sleeping in the same place. But they're, they're head to foot. They're head to foot. Everything's good, right? But, but Ruth chapter 3, a little, little weird, little there, there's that. But then we get to Ruth chapter 4. And here's what we learn. Boaz isn't just a landowner. It happens to be that he's a kinsman redeemer. And if you, if you remember about the Old Testament, what did God always tell the, the families? He said, hey, if if your husband's wife dies and you don't have a wife, she's now a widow, you go marry her and bring her into your family to preserve your brother's name, right? Be his kinsman redeemer. What well, just so happens, huh, where does Ruth happen to go into the field? Into the field of a kinsman redeemer. And Boaz, he goes into the, t- into the town in Ruth chapter 24. Turns out there's a closer relative that could redeem Ruth. And he says, hey, there's this lady, Ruth. She followed her mother-in-law. Would you want a redeemer? Now, let me remind you, she's a Moabite. She's a stranger. She's an alien. She's an orphan. And she's a widow. And that guy goes, yeah, no thank you. And so Boaz does the ultimate act of redemption. And he adopts Ruth. Makes her his wife. Makes her the mother of his children. And gives her a belonging in his family. This is way past Deuteronomy chapter 24. Boaz is now showing an act of redemption through adoption, through care, through bringing in. And here's what I don't want you to miss. Remember Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, who she made that pledge to, your God will be my God, your people my people, where you go, I will go. Naomi, who got the doggy bag from the extravagant bread dinner that we saw. Verse 13 of Ruth chapter 4. It's beautiful. And it shows how really our biblical call to care is wrapped up in the gospel of Christ Jesus. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who has more than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. And they called him Obed. For he was the father of Jesse. And Jesse, he was the father of King David. Fast forward to Matthew chapter 1. Guess who David was? The great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus the Christ. Because Boaz was willing to be inconvenienced. Because Boaz followed the commands of God. Because Boaz made his field available. Because Boaz went to the ultimate act of redemption and brought Ruth in to be his wife, to be a part of his family. Ruth joined the lineage of Jesus the Christ. The ultimate act of adoption is when we see the vulnerable come into saving faith with Christ Jesus. And that's why, that's why the Bible doesn't say that caring for orphans and vulnerable children and vulnerable women is for humanitarians, it's for the government, or for the altruistic. But caring for orphans and vulnerable children is for the people of God because it's an act of redemption. That ultimately, our prayer is, points orphans and vulnerable women and vulnerable families and vulnerable children back to the grace and the mercy of God. So they're not adopted into our families. Ultimately, they're adopted into the kingdom of God. And that's our prayer. And that's our hope. And that's why we follow through. I have a minute and I have five quick things. I'm going to rush through these. And I apologize. But couple of practical ways that we can take these commands and begin to do that. First, adoption ministry. We can help families explore adoption. We can support families before and after adoption, and we can help families fund their adoption. But second, foster care ministry. We can recruit and train foster families. We can recruit and train respite families. We can care for families who have taken 
foster care placements, by praying for them, by serving them, and pointing them to the promise of God. But we also can work with government workers and love on them and care for them and show them the love of Christ. Number three, strategic orphan care. We can minister to caregivers and institutions. We can minimize developmental deficits that children have through tutoring programs and education and job skills. We can develop opportunities for reunification and restoration with gospel intervention. But then fourth, birth parent and reunification ministry. We can bring the gospel to bear in families of origin who are struggling for the risk of losing their children. We could teach about biblical family and parenting and seek reunification and prepare families for this. And then church, church leader, something we all need to do. We need to make it a regular focus of our preaching, a regular focus of the ministry of our church. Orphan Sunday found in November is a great place to start where we spur one another on to call to care for the vulnerable, to reach outside of ourselves and care for the orphan and the widow. Biblically, if you're a child of God, we are all called to care. And so my question and ending as I pray us out is this. Following the commands of God in his word, what will you do? What's your next step? Let's pray. Father God, you're so good and gracious to us. Your word is true. It is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Lord, the words of Deuteronomy and, and the application of Ruth ring true today as they did when they were penned many years ago. Because your word is, is all-compassing. It is inspiring. It is relevant to where we stand today. And so, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for myself that we would reflect upon your call to care. And, Lord, that we would follow you in obedience, knowing that ultimately we do this all for your glory, for your gospel, and for your namesake. It's in that name that we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen.